Greetings, outcasts, free thinkers, narrative questioners, dot connectors, and genuinely open minded and outright curious inhabitants of whatever realm we exist in at the moment. You are about to embark on another free first hour episode of The Notes. If you find yourself wanting to dig deeper and have the desire to join the conversation during our monthly Melt meetups, you might want to consider becoming a monthly subscriber. For as little as three lousy Babylon hokey pokey tokens per month, you can have access to full length, early and exclusive episodes. Just visit patreon.com slash the melt podcast or click the link in the episode notes to set the process in motion. It's simple, painless, and very well might make you feel tingly inside. So without further ado, please enjoy the show. This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. As we know, different cultures have vastly different ideas about what constitutes medicine and illness. Most of what the Western model of what is called medicine really amounts to is a rudimentary relief of discomfort and symptoms, concentrating more on how an illness presents rather than its root cause. Often this is done with prescribed pharmaceuticals without much attention to one's lifestyle or the context of the illness. Things get even more murky when dealing with mental illness as it's much more subjective and is defined very differently from culture to culture. The way the West tends to treat mental illness is based in materialism and sees much of what manifests mentally as mere figments of the mind rather than take into account the possibility of something spiritual or non-physical. This presents obvious limitations and gives the illusion that certain realities aren't even on the cultural menu and therefore aren't worthy of consideration. In light of what seems to be the calcification of the Rockefeller petroleum-based medicinal monopoly, there seems to be an ever-growing awareness surrounding plant medicines and their efficacy. The one that seems to be experiencing increasing popularity in a variety of circles is ayahuasca. One of the first to set up a successful retreat center in the Amazon basin where the ayahuasca ceremony originated was today's guest, Maestro Hamilton Souther. Hunter starts the conversation in a way that's hard to succinctly summarize, so let's just dive right in. I would love to talk to you about your experience uh, that I know that uh, Chris has discussed with you before about your experience when you worked uh, in the shamanic tradition, um, specifically when you came upon uh, this man who obviously had some physical um, issue that he was dealing with, and you worked with him, and then you you became involved in that lineage. Um, I think I'm curious about what your perceptions of that were and how that happened for you. Um, you mentioned that you healed um, this particular person. And I wanted to kind of drill into that a little bit. I, I have a sense of 
um, energy and um, aligning with specific energies that maybe we are kind of brought together in the right time, right place, right time circumstance. And it sounds like that's kind of what happened with you, that you were put, you were placed in uh, a situation with someone who needed help and you were able to aid in that process. Do you feel or perceive that you healed this man or did you create space for him um, or were you a conduit for something else that was uh, using you to heal him? What are your thoughts about that? I really think that uh, all the of the above fit. Um, in that particular time in my life, I had already had a very pronounced awakening and I was experiencing this uh, kind of commonality of a conduit when necessary. It wasn't all the time. It was something that would happen when there was an actual need. And it was something that I related to as being incredibly sacred. It would, it, because it wasn't all the time. It wasn't like some power that you would, you know, think about. It would, it would be a situation where I would be in typically random circumstances, like in this case, walking down a path to go deliver food to a new person in the community, kind of doing a charitable gesture. I wasn't thinking about this. I wasn't being called. And then someone who would ultimately become very dear to me had uh, this really extreme uh, circumstances, which in this case were, you know, physical manifestations of pain, swelling in the leg, uh, what looked like, you know, very physical related illness, not just energetic or psychological, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then what would happen is I would be sort of called, I would be in a situation where, you know, I would look around and there was no one to help me. There was no one I could lean on. There was no one I could call. There was no, you know, emergency dial number. There was no ambulance. There were it, these situations would occur like this, or it was a situation where, um, there would be a, a very kind of uh, specific kind of interjection that would be needed. And what would happen in that time is something that you can't create on your own. Mm -hmm. You can't make it up. You can't uh, make it happen. You can't create the state of consciousness in which it happens. But all of a sudden, normal reality is gone. And the reality that you're in feels supercharged, like in the middle of a major electrical storm. Mm -hmm. And it's not just you that feels it. Everybody who's there feels it. And people's hair stands on end, like when they, you know, touch electrical balls and stuff like that in science fairs and things, mm -hmm. or when people get electrocuted. Like, so there's there's similarities in that sense of this great energy that that would appear at that time, and so that would go through me. And so that's very much like the conduit in terms of saying, you know, did I heal him or not? Um, you know. In the Amazon, the way they talk about it is that the person who's performing that healing is doing a job. And so they attribute the nature of the healing to that person. At the same time, though, you have to understand that they don't differentiate that person from the greater energy around them. Mm. And so it's never like that person does it alone. Right. It's always uh, it's always the conduit plus that greater energy that's around them at that time. And the term they use for it is spirit. But they also have lots of other other terms for it. They call it Tukwetana or Nyukatana, which means the force of nature or the power of nature. Uh, they say it's related to Mother Earth or Pachamama. So they have these very deep mythologies that connect to it. So in those ways, um, kind of all of the above apply in that situation. And then after the situation, sort of those uh, great skills that would appear and the, the very clear directives that I would be given would go away. And I would be back in sort of an ordinary state of consciousness, pretty much whelmed by the experience and looking around, wondering what had happened and how it had happened. That ultimately uh, was something that was trained through my apprenticeship. And that changes the experience tremendously because now you take that skill that would, or you take that sort of uh, occurrence and you turn it into a skill that becomes more repeatable, but it doesn't have that same, um, kind of like overwhelming uh, energetic kind of rush that comes naturally, except when you're in a very strong sacred plant ceremony. And so the this very, very strong sacred plant ceremony can create that and accelerate you to a state of consciousness where with what seems like very simple 
commands or very simple directives, uh, dramatic change for others takes place in terms of their physical well-being, their mental well-being, um, or their state of consciousness that they're in. So a, a, a ceremony would be more of a making space situation. You're making a space for people to go through or whatever they need to go through uh, under the guise of this experience with ayahuasca. Yeah, in the case of an ayahuasca ceremony, it's a part spiritual endeavor, simply because the practice of plant medicine in the Amazon is is never separated from the energetics of the forest itself. And I think there's a real big misunderstanding between Western concepts of spirituality and what the Amazonian people are referring to when they talk about spirit. So I think they're really talking about the fact that the biomass of the Amazon is really, it's it's alive. Like Mm -hmm, you go into it and it is whelmingly alive. I was in the jungle today and it's just so powerful how much of the cycle of life is happening all the time. And you can feel the jungle growing. It's just, it's unbelievably powerful. When you use something like ayahuasca, you go into a state of consciousness and into kind of a trance state that makes you very receptive to how much energy that forest represents and the plants represent at that time. So you become very sensitive. So I, you know, I've heard of sort of the scientific idea that we use our five senses to filter out trillions of stimuli a second. Mm -hmm. And I think of that just as sort of the great energetic field that we're part of all the time. And then when you drink something like ayahuasca, instead of filtering it out, your brain flips and it starts to, to bring it in and start to relate to it. And, uh, it's multidimensional. It's multi colored it's it has colors that represent not only the rainbow but more colors than you've ever seen um it's it's incredibly intense the the amount of power that it can have to you so the healers in the amazon who are really like western practicing doctors in Mm -hmm. their own right they they're practicing a medicine for people that don't have hospitals to go to uh harness that energy and they found the way to be able to do that through the plant medicines themselves And it just happens that there are certain energies found within that biomass that are very healing. They're very curative for people. And so when you go into an ayahuasca ceremony, you want to really open the whole ceremony and and the the space for everybody to receive as much of that as absolutely possible. But it's also recognized that not everything from that biomass represents the kinds of energies that actually create healing. Right. And so then there's another job, which is sort of a filtering of those energies to make sure that the people are really receiving a channel of the kinds of energies that really do produce healings and the kinds of frequencies from that that do. And then the other ones are just not as included in the ceremony itself. That that leads me to a question. Do you perceive that there are trickster spirits in that ceremony that could uh, maybe be perceived as something that is a healing energy, but but maybe is a detractor or a, a distractor from that healing energy. For sure. I think that the, the nature of our own psyches, especially because of the philosophies and mythologies that we've been brought up in, are very dualistic. And so because of that, we're constantly shown representations of humans being trustworthy and humans being fraudsters or liars. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everyone went through the terrible twos where we all learned how to say yes and no to things that might not be (laughs) no or yes. Uh, You know, so in our psychology, that's a very deep rooted form of linguistics and a way of framing information. And today's day and age, there's this tremendous polarization, even greater than in my youth, Mm -hmm. both politically and in in and around gender and race. Um, And so in seeing that we have that deeply ingrained with us, Uh, There's also in the jungle predator and prey. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really core nature sort of fundamental duality that that is in play. And then because of that, there's also this great mythology and it's a living mythology. It's lived with by the people. It's it's really in them. I was in a restaurant having lunch today and there was someone singing a song with a guitar and they were singing about how to, they were singing in the song, they were singing to their uh, brother-in-law to be careful of the anaconda that if you went over there, it could lure you in and eat you. And so that's a very dualistic concept. So in that, there are energies that we certainly find. And when you unpack the psyche, 
in ayahuasca, there's this incredible moment where uh, what defines you as unique and individual gets transcended and you become really much part more part of the greater field. And in there, there's just it's just now a field of energy. So all the archetypes that you have in your psyche are there. All of the nature uh, entities and energies that are there, like trees and birds and jaguars and mountains and things like that are there, rivers, etc. cetera. Um, so when you get into that, there are different kinds of visions that people have where they relate to the entities within them as being tricksters or you know leading you astray or not really wanting to give the healing, uh, you know, or lead you to healing in such an easy way. And that's a part of the job that we have to help align that path for somebody so that they really are guided to your healing in, in the most efficient and simplest way. And what is that process? Like, how do you do that when you're dealing with someone that that maybe is being subjected to that or in their own psyche? How do you kind of get them back realign them i think that's where the practices in the amazon are called arts and it's an art form um you learn through being in visionary states you know over and over again um during apprenticeship how to differentiate the energies that are supportive and the energies that are antagonistic i don't think it's any different than as we're growing up we learn the same kinds of things only this is something that you know you practice literally hundreds to thousands of times you can practice it hundreds of times a night and before you're really considered a viable practitioner you've had hundreds of ceremonies of experience so hundreds times hundreds ultimately is a tremendous amount of opportunities to learn how to differentiate those energies the easiest way to really do it though is to learn how to continuously emit intention into the room that can guide the energies that are there mm. and so instead of saying these are good and these are bad i like to think of these are the ones that are helpful and these are the ones that are being purged or released the ones that are being purged or released don't have a reason to be interacting with you anymore the ones that are helpful are there to be able to continue to help you to be able to purge and release more of the energies um, that ultimately create that kind of antagonistic experience Earlier, you mentioned uh, that you guys deal with people who can't make it to a hospital or aren't near one, uh, which makes it sound like what you do and what hospitals do are interchangeable. Um, but I'm, I would suspect that there are things that you guys can deal with that hospitals don't and vice versa. Uh, how much overlap is there? And do people... I mean, are there people that come to you first and then if you guys can't do something, they go to the hospital or vice versa? How, how does, what place does what you do uh, have in the society there? That's a really good question. The very first thing we learn is to diagnose the illness itself, to be, to understand whether it's an illness to be treated by plant medicine or to be treated by hospital medicine. And so there's a, a fundamental sort of friendly relationship between the idea of the plant medicine and the medicine that's practiced in hospitals or Western medicine. And they're seeing ultimately that, that what the plant medicines do really well, the hospitals just have not yet learned how to be able to codify and understand in a scientific way. Although now there's a lot more research that's finally happening on it. And there's a there are ways of starting to understand it from a scientific mind that gives validity to the practices. When Typically, when you see illnesses that would be treated in the hospital, it has to do with the speed at which you can heal them in the hospital or the how uh, kind of the state of emergency that somebody's in to be able to to receive that intervention. So, for instance, you, there are certain kinds of antibiotics that you can naturally get from the forest, but pill form antibiotics are just better at, at healing uh, infections. So if you have a skin infection, we would tell somebody to go get pills from the, the pharmacy if they have the availability to do that. And if they don't, we could use different plants and use it as a poultice to be able to over the infected area to be able to treat it. And you could get different kinds of barks and roots from various trees. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the trees that we work with uh, often is a tree called Remo Caspi. And in the last 10 years, it's going to be or it's been discovered to be the next generation cure for malaria or treatment for malaria. And so it's actually moving from 
the plant medicine side over now to the the pharma side and it's going to be used ubiquitously uh in the you know in a pill form and so you you diagnose it and then you uh you ultimately send people where they need to go and then often it depends on the quality of the western medical care as well there's and the further you get into the amazon the more remote it gets the lower the the quality of western medicine goes down and so in those cases a lot of people actually get released from western medical care still needing some, some kind of support or intervention and then they come and they look for the natural healers gotcha i'm sure yeah you wouldn't go to a hospital saying i have a negative spirit that seems to be attached to me <laughs> they probably would just no. shrug their shoulders and go i can't help you i don't uh, you know i can't measure that you know yeah what they will say is go talk to a psychologist uh-huh and the psychologist may look at them here and actually say, oh, I think you need to go to an ayahuasca oh, shaman mm, or cool. go to an ayahuasca healer. Mm -hmm. And so they'll actually guide somebody to that if they're aware of it and understand how that person could help with that. I think they would first suss out whether or not the person's really delusional or they really do have kind of a, a phantasm in terms of their own psyche going on. And if that's something that could be helped by ayahuasca, they would recommend it. Cool. And like like they're doing studies here with psilocybin, with people, you know, helping people shake alcoholism, or um, with uh, patients who are have terminal illnesses, helping them to deal with the impending death that they're about ready to experience. How psilocybin has helped with that, and the research that's happening here. Are they doing sort of the same thing with ayahuasca there? I think ayahuasca has traditionally been used for now thousands of years for those purposes. Yeah, I mean, are they um, are are there do are the scientists or whatever doing studies as far as ayahuasca's effects? You know, what I'm absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are there are uh, tests going on, but just recently I heard that uh, the first studies in the U.S. have already been uh, created as well around mm. ayahuasca. I haven't heard. I that. think that yeah, and I think that. Um, the way that the studies are being done because of the politics and legislation around the plants themselves and the substances associated with them and drug laws are, you know, really looking at problems that Western medicine can't treat in any way, mm -hmm. like terminal illness and end of life. Yeah. And so in, you know, in, or untreatable depression or untreatable PTSD. And so I think in those cases, it's such an extreme uh, scenario to, to study in that it really leaves out a lot of the different uses of plant medicines. And that really there are lots of psychological benefits from using ayahuasca for less extreme circumstances. And so most of the time in the Amazon, what happens is that you end up going to somebody to experience plant medicine or ayahuasca before you have such a grave situation taking place. So before you would even develop PTSD, when it's actually still you know, not post-traumatic, it's mm -hmm. actually right after the trauma, you would go and get healing for the trauma itself before it gets rooted into some other kind of kind of reverberation in your psyche and actual change to your neural network and brain functioning, et cetera. Same thing for um, different kinds of lesser traumatic issues like breaking up in a relationship or, or the end of a marriage or something like that. Often people will go and immediately seek some kind of spiritual intervention and help because of that. So is it is it generational in its usage? Are there people who um, have just always been exposed to ayahuasca, and so it is like aspirin in your medicine cabinet? Like you kind of know if you you have some kind of form of a trauma, or your child does, for example, you would know that that might be the first uh, course of action as opposed to going and seeking some psychological intervention, like going to a therapist. Yeah. in the Amazon ayahuasca has been used as the psychiatric medicine and period. I mean, it's, it's a way of being thought of as both a uh, cleansing for the body and also kind of a disc defrag using a tech metaphor mm. for the mind. And so whenever somebody has problems in this sort of more on the psychological side, that's when they intervene with ayahuasca. They've been intervening for addiction. Um, the stories go back sort of many, many generations. Whenever anyone has sort of just general melancholy, the same thing. I think one of the things that was most interesting to me from the anthropological side, 
when I got into the Amazon in 2002, 2003, was that the local people didn't have in their vocabulary the term depression or anxiety mm-hmm. or trauma. Wow. They just they didn't have the words. And so uh, when you know, some of our guests would show up and start talking to the locals about why they were there and they said that they were healing depression or they're healing their anxiety disorder, the locals looked at them like they didn't even understand what they were really referring to. <laughs> mm-hmm. They were trying to say, is, like, is anxiety like a bad day? Mm-hmm. Is it sort of like a bad day? Well, if you have like three or four bad days in a row, the locals will ultimately go drink ayahuasca and, and solve it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. We were talking before uh, earlier uh, this evening about the sort of subjectivity, cultural subjectivity of mental illness, quote unquote. What what are things in Peru that are more common, would be commonly described as mental illnesses, like we would have depression or PTSD? What are things in Peru culturally that they experience uh, commonly that they come and, and get ceremony for? I think just what we would think of as ultimately the root causes of those illnesses. So I think just if somebody goes through a really hard time, they'll be treated with ayahuasca. If somebody uh, has a physical trauma, for instance, like they fall and break their leg, they'll heal the leg and they'll use, you know, all the same techniques as an orthopedist would. And then they'll also heal the spirit of the person or their energy with ayahuasca. Um, If they had a strong infection, it would be the same thing. They would go through the healing of the infection. And then when they were healed from that, they would go have an ayahuasca ceremony to purge the sort of lasting effects of it. If they've had a breakup, it's common. Uh, It's really common for when teenagers go through the experience of their first love and they think they've awakened to the glory of romance and then it Mm. all, you know, goes away. It's a typical disaster scenario. They immediately take the teenager to go have ayahuasca and say, well, you know, get over this. This is how we're going to get over this thing. And so I think it's, um, you know, that's more common. As Peru has been developing and the cities develop, you get all the same kinds of illnesses in the cities that you get anywhere else in the world. And I think it's a kind of social um, and culturalization of the of what co- the cause of the illness and then ultimately the the rooting of that illness within somebody and then also how to try to treat it or relate to it. Do you think that there's any generational healing that's done with the ayahuasca ceremony? So if you have, let's say, you have some um, physical manifestation of a illness that you can actually connect that illness to someone maybe three or four generations back and the ayahuasca uh, can be used to heal that um illness yeah absolutely for you know some people it's hard to relate to how you could open up kind of time like that like how is it possible in a ceremony to be able to even make that connection Mm -hmm. and you go into a, a very distorted typically experience of time and in the visions themselves you can relate to ancestors that you've met and ones you haven't met and I think of us as really the product of evolution mm-hmm. and evolution being generation to generation to generation of all of us. And I think we all come ultimately from the same family tree. Mm-hmm. If we go all the way back in time to the first humans, they're, even if they appeared in multiple places or right. uh, from you know various groups, it's still a very small number for there now to be 8 billion mm-hmm. or so, give or take, of humans. And so... Um, in that case, you know, you go into ayahuasca and the ayahuasca starts to open you up to that field of consciousness that we talked about. And in that field of consciousness is your evolutionary history. Mm-hmm. And it's also connected to that that energy of nature that we were talking about. And if you have in you, and it would, in my mind, make sense if you're, you know, part actual physical matter from your mother and father mm-hmm. and their part physical matter from their parents and go back three, four generations you do have a connection to the nature of that physical matter. And the, the I think an incredible impact on that physical matter in our lifetime is the lives uh, that our ancestors lived. Exactly. And the lives that they've lived has been very hard. They've been very intense lives. So 
the idea of sort of modern comfort is a very new thing. Mm -hmm. And the kind of ideas of modern sensibilities are a very new thing. And so if there's psychological issues inside the family line, if there are other kinds of uh, propensities to having had very difficult experiences, which could have led to different traumas or depression, if there's different kinds of disorders inside the family line, you certainly can in ayahuasca go into that and liberate somebody from that. I, I always thought it was an idea that you want to just bring an end to the illness itself and the root cause of it. So if the root cause is within your lifetime, then we'll heal it from that root. And if it goes back further than that, heal it from there as well. Yeah, so it's like a cellular memory. It's like your cells are a collection of all of the DNA that goes into your into your humanity, into your humanness. And you could potentially even be healing uh, some part of your DNA or, or your cell that wasn't even in your direct lineage. So maybe someone that had some physical traumatic death around maybe one of your relatives and they absorbed that energy. I think it's possible to heal that as well. It's almost like uh, carrying the baton of um, a lineage and you, if you have enough energy, you are given the capacity to hold that baton and carry it and then heal whatever, uh, whatever um, ill may have, have manifested. Yeah, and inside the ayahuasca ceremony, you kind of unpack the totality of your psyche. And ultimately, what we found in there from a Western perspective is a lot more than what we've yet to really fully explore with psychology and psychiatry. There's a lot more going on in there. It's very hard to relate until you've had the experience. But mm. some people say inside an ayahuasca ceremony, it's like living a thousand years. Wow. So in terms of like lifetime, they come out of it the next day and they say, how long was that ceremony? And they say, for me, it was like a thousand years. Amazing. So in, in that, they're not lying. They're not making it up. They're no, not laughing. For but sure. then somehow they went into a state of consciousness where they experienced time as if it had been a thousand years. Someone else in that exact same ceremony could have said it felt like a five hour ceremony was five minutes or 10 mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah. And they went in and it was just over for them. And they say, how long was that? And we say, you know, five hours. And they say, that's impossible. Mm. Right. So in that thousand years, you can unpack an unbelievable amount of what's going on inside consciousness itself. And consciousness is really a kind of yet to be fully explored topic. Mm -hmm. If psychology is dipping into it and, and we're getting further into the understandings of this, the nature of consciousness itself as we are conscious beings uh, opens up to something that is in psychedelic experiences vastly greater than how we can relate to life from the typical Western linear mind. The typical Western linear mind, um, it kind of shuts off in ceremony. It can still be present. You still can be very, very lucid. But your awarenesses can expand tremendously to understand interconnections, uh, relationships, the way energies affect people, um, the way language has affected people, uh, what it's like for 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. 10,000, even 100,000 years of history. Mm. It can expand the framing in which we uh, relate to life in a, kind of a, in very dramatic and very vast ways. And so in that, if you have that intention to heal, and if you have the intention to guide your ceremony to that exploration of consciousness, you can shed uh, tremendous amounts of connections and interdependences that have been created to the family lineage, to the impact that others had on the family lineage, mm -hmm. to the impact that history had on the family lineage, to yourself, you can affect the healing of other people in a positive way that you know and don't know. People talk about um, being in ceremonies and with people that they just met and actually uh, intertwining visions and going into visions with each other and seeing what the other people were going through and helping them along that way wow. in That's terms amazing. of the, the ceremony. It's, we were talking, Chris and I were talking earlier about something that I'm studying in deviant behavior, and it's about the labeling theory of mental illness and how that directly relates 
to how people's healing process works. So if you've been labeled mentally ill or you've been labeled schizophrenic or manic depressive, that that actually can bolster and entrench that mental illness because what the label does is then it creates a certain system around you that supports you being mentally ill. So people, you know, 200 years ago or a hundred years ago that were put in asylums, they reacted and acted out because they were treated in a very specific way. So do you think that one of the reasons that maybe mental illness is not um, managed in the same way or even approached in the same way in Peru is because there's no labeling hap happening there? Well, I think we first have to differentiate being the, the, the Peru modern society and then the native societies. Right. And in the native societies, there isn't the same understanding of the labeling. Mm -hmm. There is an idea of sort of a good person and a bad person. Mm. And there, so there is that kind of a concept. Um, but the modern societies have all of the same labeling that, that we all have now. Mm -hmm. They've adopted Western medicine in its totality. And, you know, the schools have child psychologists and the children get the same labels, et cetera, that we see um, you know, happening now kind of in all of the Western developed societies. Mm -hmm. I think that we have yet to really admit to ourselves the impact that our environment has on us mm. and the labels that we give ourselves and the labels that are put on us. Yeah, yeah. I think they're incredibly shaping For sure. and incredibly forming of who we know ourselves to be inside our mind. Mm -hmm. I think inside our mind, it's kind of like a great uh, hall of mirrors and it's been codified in many different forms by uh, psychology over the last decades. Mm -hmm. But inside that, you have to decide for yourself who and what you are. And so when you get given a label, you have to relate to that. And if you attach that label to your I am, mm -hmm. so you say I am and then the label and you mean it, then that becomes a very strong fixation in your psyche. And you'll relate to that in the way that you've been instructed to relate to it because you don't have a frame of reference for it. Yeah. So I go back to the infant and an infant, you know, day old, two days old, three days old, doesn't know who they are yet. Right. Hasn't been told what gender they are yet. Hasn't been told what name they are yet. Hasn't been uh, attributed certain colors or certain sounds to them that they can relate to yet. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite a process to get an infant to recognize themselves, recognize their name recognize their parents, recognize the archetypal labels like mother and father that are given to the parent or the parent gives to the child to know who they are, mm -hmm. to be able to form the nature of those bonds. As that goes on, you know, decade after decade, as you get older, the way you relate to those uh, those terms that become part of your archetypal matrix are, I think, incredibly important. And ultimately, they're environment based. And you don't have a lot of control over that. You have almost none. When you're born to a family, that's the family you get. The way they understand the archetypes are the way they're presented to you. And then the way the society, really where you are geographically and socioeconomically, then defines the nature of how you're going to have that experience. And it's something that's very difficult to change in somebody. I've always said that the moment when somebody has truly been healed, and they can move on from the healing process is when they no longer attach the label to the I am. So they show up saying, I am an addict. And then when they leave, they don't say I am an addict anymore. When they show up, they say, I am depressed. When they leave, they don't say I am depressed anymore. They can't say it. They literally can't form the words because it doesn't represent a factual truth anymore. That's amazing. Do, do are, are there people in... Uh, the Amazon who are homeless, for example, are there people that don't aren't part of the community? And how do those people live? Well, in the cities, there there are homeless. Although very few Peruvian cities allow anybody to uh, go hungry. Mm. Yeah, I think that I can hear you now. Oh. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, the internet was a little unstable there for a second. Um, so in the Peruvian cities, people, there are homeless people, but people don't really go hungry. Mm. So there are people who just don't have uh, homes. Most of the people who don't have that kind of shelter have fallen into some kind of drug addiction. Mm. And 
the most common one is is sniffing of uh, chemical products. Mm. So Yikes. sniffing glue, right? Or um, either also the other, I guess, common drug is sort of the precursor to cocaine, which is a kind of basic paste they call it. I've heard about it, mm. um, and so. But that's it, again, it's a situation where the uh, petrochemical industry is involved in, I mean, it's being used, the chemicals are being used to create these, these different substances and people are consuming them and it can create addiction in different forms. But other than that, in the uh, river towns, there is, is no homeless people, literally no one's homeless and really no one goes hungry. Mm. Amazing. I, I never really thought about it before, but it seems so obvious thinking about it. Uh, is that uh, ayahuasca and ayahuasca ceremony is a very interesting mode of healing because usually, you know, in the West, we go to a doctor, we describe our symptoms, they, you know, go down their list of pharmaceuticals and dole out whatever they think is necessary. And you see how it works. But in ceremony, I mean, there may be, I don't know how big, how many people come to a, a ceremony or how big they get, but they're all coming in with different quote unquote ailments, different things going on, but they're all taking the same medicine. Um, so it's in between, it's like a relationship between the person and the spirit of ayahuasca. And it has really nothing to do with uh, a dose. Well, I guess, you know, I guess they do, people do, um, decide how much of a dose they're going to take. But that's very, that's an autonomy that you don't usually incorporate in Western healing. So I think that's an, a very interesting uh, aspect of all this. Same medicine for everybody, but it can help people with a, a wide array of different things going on. Yeah, I think it's a really, I think it's easier to think of it as like a consciousness medicine. And if the illnesses are somehow rooted in your consciousness itself and even physically manifesting because of that, the root cause could be vast, but how you're going to heal it is ultimately the same. And so, in, you know, I've held ceremonies anywhere from two, three people to 40 to 50 people. And I've heard of uh, other groups that have hold healing ceremonies that were in the hundreds to even thousands of people in Brazil. And they're different, obviously, different kinds of, of healing ceremonies or different kinds of gatherings. But in the a situation where you have 30 to 40 people all going through an ayahuasca ceremony at the same time, each one is in their own timeline. Each person is in their own psyche. Each person is representing their own um, intentions and their own reasons for being there. And so you try to fulfill those reasons for each person at the same time. And the way that you do it is you hold a collective intention for everybody. So maybe that collective intention is healing. Like the reason why we're here is healing or the reason why we're here is healing and learning or the reason that we're here is to optimize our life. And the way to optimize it is people who need healing will go through healing and transcend the need to be healed. People who need less healing, but maybe they need to straighten out some life decisions will have the opportunity to be able to do that. So you can hold a general intention and then through the night as you're practicing in the ceremony, you, you call on um, all the different kinds of plants and animals and energies and uh, guides that, that come from the ayahuasca itself. It's an amalgam of the psyche of the participant and the, what's available from nature and the ayahuasca to ultimately have a very different visionary uh, scenario unfolding for each person at the same time. So 30 people, 30 different timelines, all having the intention of healing, going through a different healing journey and based on the requirements of that individual's healing journey. So someone might be healing family context and they go through things associated with the family. Someone else could be healing depression and they could have, um, you know, a purge where everything that's just causing the depression, like this incredible darkness just mm. comes out of them kind of all the symptoms just come out another person could be healing uh childhood trauma and uh the divorce of their parents and going through you know an unpacking of the nature of that experience and how it ultimately unfolded for them i think what's really interesting is that 
it's not as literal to the ex- to the normal life experiences as people might think. It's mm-hmm. not like a regression and going back and reliving something and reframing that thing. Often it's more like a person goes into a multidimensional kind of field and soup of energy mm. and the 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 stuff inside them as the vibration and the intensity of the the ceremony and of the visions it goes up that stuff inside them that represents lower frequency energy or darker energy or malaise or illness ultimately just comes out of them mm. it can be sweated out it can be breathed out mm. it can be yawned out um some people laugh it out and then in more extreme cases people will vomit it or mm have uh, defecation and it will literally come out or they'll sweat it out Mm. and then it's gone i have a kind of a strange question is the ceremony done indoors or outdoors it's a kind of a two-part question (laughs) well there's both there are ceremonies that take place indoors and outdoors but we usually traditionally have ceremony in a roundhouse they call it a maloka Mm -hmm. and um it's sort of indoor outdoor. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, right. It's very, very common to someone's kind of like screened in back deck. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so if you, it's like a, you know, typically a wood floor with a palm thatched roof uh-huh. and screening around it, or in a lot of cases, no screening. Um, where we are, there's screening. And so just to protect from mosquitoes and things like that. But traditionally, it's the living is very indoor outdoor living. Because you don't need windows, for instance. There's, right. The temperature in the Amazon is between 80 and 100 degrees every day of the year. And it's between typically 60, 70 to percent humidity to 100 percent humidity every day of the year. And the second part of that question is, d- uh, how does the environment respond to the ayahuasca ceremony? So um, I'm talking like animals, birds, insects. Do they do they engage or respond? Do they get quiet? Is there some kind of a, a response? Yeah, it's actually a phenomenal part of the ayahuasca ceremony is rhythms and sounds. And so an ayahuasca ceremony starts in silence and there's a setting of intention and you you know something's happening when you go in there. It, people are are already starting to understand that something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. There are doubts and confusions, but you know, it's kind of the 15 minutes before there's milling around and people are kind of quietly talking and stuff but then a minute before the formal ceremony really starts you can tell something's about to happen <laughs> and then uh and then ikaros are used to start the ceremony so they're first the ikaros are used to the actual bottle of the ayahuasca that everybody's going to drink and then each person is individually served and then the ikaros start and there's rhythms that accompany them that can be uh, performed through rattles or these leaf instruments called chacapas or drums, depending on the, the lineage that someone comes from. And once the ikaros start, the ikaros sound like chants, but it's a kind of vocalization that's unique to itself. When that starts, um, it's very common that nature starts to accompany mm. the rhythms and start to fall into um, all different kinds of of order with it. It takes on an an, an interdimensional shape and form that extends beyond that of just a performer and a listener and everything, including the nature around it gets drawn in. Mm. So pretty soon the, the cicadas and the grasshoppers are creating rhythms (laughs) that could be in syncopated rhythms or, or actually pulsating rhythms with the, the guidance that the ceremonial leader is giving. (laughs) And then The other frogs will come in and they start to create accents <laughs> to it, like on cue and on time. And then uh, birds like the owls will come out and they'll hoot and and they'll come in also like symbols on drums, like at the right time. <laughs> and wow. really nature becomes a part of the of the experience. And you can't differentiate consciousness from nature at that time. Like the idea of Pachamama, Mother Earth moves beyond kind of a mentalization of energy or an effigy or an image you've seen of sort of the earth in the womb of a mother mm. and it, it's actually an alive an aliveness and an awareness that's there and people can relate to that and 
Other times people feel that the actual nature, like the different animals, um, make the sounds right when something's going to come for them, like a purge mm. or a release. Interesting. Like they're being accompanied or guided. And uh, it's very, very common for that sort of great symphony of the forest to come alive. And I think it's maybe one of the most interesting experiences to have because it takes away the separation, like when you go on a walk in nature or you right. go on a hike. And it's like, you don't really feel exactly like in through and all around part and parcel of the forest or the nature. But in those moments in an ayahuasca ceremony, you can see how connected everybody truly is and how we're, we're not alone in our mind and alone in our consciousness in that natural setting. We're actually being observed. The other things are around us see us and know us there and we're actually welcomed by them. We're not just thought to be a predator or a negative uh, force there. In fact, the nature wants to heal you. It's loving, it's kind, it's supportive. It, it, in sort of that density that the forest represents and in that heat and in that humidity, instead of it being like a hard thing, like people will talk about like, oh, it's so hot, it's so humid, you know, it actually becomes like a warm blanket. It's like mm. a cocoon, it's soothing you, it's holding you. It's it's like being in suspended animation. It's it's uh, comforting, and the nature and the sounds of the other animals are there supporting that experience. Yeah, I was going to ask, kind of in the, an environmental question, also too, the places where the ceremonies are conducted. Is there a different like? I mean, I guess the only way I can think to put it is the veil thinner there because of the the kind of activity that happens that's so intense, especially if there's a lot of people. Does it seem to be sort of a vortex for other sorts of activity? I don't know whether, I don't know how to describe that, spiritual, paranormal, stuff like that. All of it. Yeah, all of those things. I think it's a great way to, to relate to it. Um, if you do ceremonial work, your ceremonial center becomes charged with that vibe and energy. I don't think of it as any different as when you go into one person's house and it feels one way. Yeah. <clears throat> you go into another person's house, it feels another way. Sure. Only that ceremonial house is being used for very specific kinds of energetic purposes. And they, the part of this healing process is the opening of portals or the opening of vortexes. A really good ceremonial center is a place where lots of change happens, like dramatic change. So I think of it as an epicenter for change. Mm. Um, the plants in the Amazon, the medicinal plants, are said to have guardians or mm. mothers, they call them. Mm -hmm. And so those can become present. And the locals talk about seeing them or hearing them all the time. And in the West, people would consider that paranormal activity. Um, people come with beliefs of all different kinds of understandings from all different mythologies. And so some people, you know, relate to um, Hindu deities and mm -hmm. other people relate to plant medicine spirits and other people relate to uh, the idea of aliens, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, kind of this more paranormal thinking. And so because of that, because that is in people's psyches, it can also become part of the vibration of the space that's there. And then if people have connections to those things, then they can have the experience of it. So there, are, you know, it's very common to hear of uh, that kind of vortex idea or paranormal idea or energetic charge uh, being part of the ceremonial uh, experience. I always thought the goal was to have the, the locus of the ceremony to be an epicenter of change. Is healing requires change, learning requires change, and. Um, when you've been, I think, accustomed to different kinds of difficulties or darkness or um, just repetitive experience, sometimes it's hard to, to engender change for yourself. Sometimes yeah. it can be scary, even mm -hmm. though you want it, it can be scary to change. And so you need to go to a place that has embraced the nature of that change mm -hmm. and has really fully embraced the totality of the life force and what it is to go through the entire cycle of life. And to be able to see it as something that's a true miracle and something that's really incredible and really beautiful and can really welcome the nature of that change. So I always like to think of our ceremonial center as a, a universal place for, as an epicenter of change for positive transformation and really the success for everybody who comes. 
Yeah, it seems like the veil would definitely be thinner for someone in your position too. Any shaman who is not only, I mean, people come and they do maybe three, I'm not sure how many ceremonies in a week they may do, but you're doing them all the time. So you've got the, the medicine in your system almost constantly. So it seems like, I bet at points, it, it's not such a hard boundary in between ceremony and the rest of existence. <laughs> True. I think there's a blending. At first, it was really intense. It was really intense to see through the lens of ceremony. But I think ultimately you come to realize that what the ayahuasca is showing you is the something more that you always knew was there. You just maybe didn't know how to relate to it. You know, but there's something more going on to life than just what we know. There's still the unknown. And the nature of, of being in lots of ayahuasca ceremonies, and it's an important caveat that the only people in the Amazon who do that are the practitioners. So the people don't drink ayahuasca over and over and over and right, over. Yeah. It's not their spiritual practice. You know, right. um, you go through training to be able to see life and understand life through that sort of more expanded lens. And it actually becomes very uh, soothing and very centering and, and very stabilizing to recognize the nature of those energies and um, to be in that visionary state. I always thought that there were kind of two states of sobriety and consciousness. One was the one that where you're completely sober because you haven't had any kind of substances. And the other was the experience in ayahuasca because of how repetitive and lucid it is. Mm -hmm. And so at first it can seem like a, a such a dramatic differentiation, but pretty soon it's just a nature of how you see the world and how you understand dimensionality, how you understand the idea of spirit and spirituality, how you understand the psyche and the importance of archetype and mythology. And it becomes then how you relate to the world. And fundamentally, um, the nature of ayahuasca as a medicinal plant is an incredible loving force. It, it really does help people in numerous ways, not only to transcend trauma and difficulties, but also uh, find a, a much more stable and uh, harmonious understanding and representation of their own life. How do you find your perception when you go into uh, the city and you are out of the Amazon and you have to go into a city to maybe do some work or something. Do you find that you are more uh, like, do you have to go with your shields up and, and kind of protect yourself? Um, do you feel an onslaught of, of energy from other people? Are you able to perceive at a, a greater level or maybe a heightened frequency because of how many ceremonies you have witnessed and be, been a part of? I think cities have a lot of chaotic energy in them. Um, I recognize the importance specifically of machines. It's an industrialized uh, expression of what we've created. I don't think you have to have such an idea of defenses. I don't think of these things as harming or uh, something that needs to be protected from. I think in a city, you need to know how to navigate the city rationally and not go to the areas of the city that are dangerous that I actually really wish didn't exist. But, but they do exist. And so um, I feel for the people and I have a lot of compassion for the people that live within those environments. And I have a lot of uh, real respect for the incredible resilience and adaptability of human life. I wish more people in those environments could have a nicer life and actually uh, have an easier life. And I think the city life is, is really hard. It's a really hard life, but it has a kind of an enchantment and enticing quality to it. Um, in some places in the Amazon, very simply, like cold beverages. And in other places, the idea of just creature comforts and control, like over the temperature of your environment. Um, but what I do notice in the cities is that there are very few people who... Um, who really represent a kind of harmony with their environment. And most of the people in the forest live in a kind of continuous harmony with the nature of their environment. 
And so I just recognize those things and uh, respect them for what they are and try to navigate it to the best of my ability, like I think like anyone else. I highly respect the cities for what they are. I think they're an incredible invention and creation. So I don't think you have to protect yourself so much from it. Although I, I think other people are probably much more sensitive than I am. I think the I think ayahuasca ceremonies, um, they make you very aware, but they also harden you to the nature of certain kinds of energies. Because if you're if you're very sensitive, not not taking away empathy, but so if you can be very empathetic but not as sensitive, then you can withstand the energies that come through the ceremonies in a, a much more heightened way. Because people are going through the worst traumas that they could possibly go through. Yeah. So you get trained to not be desensitized to the the empathy, but desensitized to the energies themselves. And the energies that you go through in a ceremony are actually much tougher than the ones you typically see in a, in a city. Most people who are in ceremony are purging all of the gnarliest and and worst things that happened in cities. Mm. What is the role of, or is there a role uh, of dreams, importance of dreams in your particular shamanic practice? Dreams are really important. You get trained in your dreams. So most of the training we do comes in two forms. One is through a process called dieta, which are these diets or fastings that you do. You reduce your caloric intake to just a couple hundred calories a day, and you drink non-psychoactive medicinal plants. And the goal of them is to unite the medicinal plant with you. And because it's not psychoactive, you don't have any visions until you go into the dream space. And in the dream space, you have tremendous visions. Wow. You have lucid dreams, um, what would be considered like astral projection dreams or out-of-body dreams. Mm -hmm. And you remember your dreams in a, in a very clear, very uh, ordered, very real, concise way. And so it's in those experiences that you actually go through training. And so when we would train, you know, somewhere between uh, like nine to 11 months a year, we would actually be in formal training. Uh, we would drink ayahuasca maybe a hundred times, but that leaves the other 200 days that you were training. When, how did that, you know, what, what really occurred or how did that really happen? Well, that was all through the dream state. Wow. So you're actually working in the dream state a lot more than you are in the psychedelic state or in the visionary state. So you you train through the dietas and you train through the dream practices, and then you train through the visionary practices. And ultimately the goal is to have dominion over your consciousness and psyche so that you don't really differentiate between the visionary states, the dreaming states and the normal waking states. You can you understand them all as like a, a fluid movement of the mind that gets trained. And that's very much like mystical arts or meditative arts. Um, but it's, it is unique in the Amazon, how they developed those over the last thousands of years. Can you, before we draw this to a close, maybe tell people where they can find you and Blue Morpho online? Yes, for sure. Uh, you can find us at bluemorphotours.com and Blue Morpho again is open. It's an incredible thing. You know, the first time we closed in our history because of COVID. And so uh, Blue Morph was open again, and it's incredible to come here. Flying down to Peru is really easy. You just fly through Lima and then to our city. So bluemorphotours.com, check us out online. Come on a retreat this year. We'll have uh, retreats every month this year and into next year. And you can also find me on social media, on Instagram and Facebook at Hamilton Souther and Hamilton Souther Official. So Fantastic. come and meet Wonderful. us, and we're accessible. We're here to talk. Write us. Communicate with us, uh, join our community if you're interested. And if you're ready for ayahuasca and plant medicine, we'll be happy to guide you in the most professional and safe way possible. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Hamilton. And you're we, welcome. Thank you for having me on the podcast again. For sure. We'll do it again uh, sometime down the line and have a fantastic rest of your evening. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Hi. What'd, what'd you think, honey bunny? <laughs> I am so happy that we had Hamilton on. I'm so glad that we were able to do a deep dive. And I feel like we covered a lot of terrain and we ended on a really good note. For sure. Yeah. He's a, a great person. Um, I think the last time that I interviewed him, it wasn't 
video. So it was great to see the actual person that I was talking to. But yeah, it's uh, such a vast experience. (laughs) I didn't even think that I could describe my own experience very um, accurately, but it was super, super intense. I can't imagine not having any sort of guide and just kind of (laughs) locking your apartment door and doing it yourself. (laughs) That just sounds insane to me. Absolutely insane. It's such an intense, powerful experience. Yeah, I, I think going into anything like that, you know, you really have to know what the potential of that experience could be. And uh, for me, I would never put myself in a situation where I would be doing something like that, that I could be running down the street naked. <laughs> exactly. <It's> puking. Um, <laughs> or not puking, you know, just in any state. <laughs> <laughs> and I had read for a good at least 20 years, I'd been researching ayahuasca, um, not in and of itself, but it was in the stuff that I was researching and pouring through, a lot of Terrence McKenna stuff. And um, so I, I mean, I thought that I knew. I knew that I was getting into something very intense. And I knew that I needed to have a tremendous amount of respect going into it. So I was very intimidated. Um, But there is no way, no way that I could have uh, had any inkling as to what was going to transpire yeah, I I am in awe of anyone that is silly enough, brave enough, <laughs> or or absurd enough to try to do that by themselves. I yeah. I have, you know, I have such tremendous respect for plant medicine, and I've had my own experiences with synthetic medicine and plant medicines that. I just would never do something like that lightly. Yeah. And I love talking about the natural world and how the natural world responds to these ceremonies. Mm-hmm. I just we could have talked about that for hours yeah. about the, you know, the owls and the insects and you know how they they are in harmony with these uh ceremonies and it just reminded me of our time when we went uh, on our camping trip and we had our own psychedelic psychedelic experience and how the environment uh, responded you you know we were playing beautiful ambient music and the uh, insects were singing along with the music and I feel like so much of that has to do with your energy and your openness and your ability to allow other things in um, that are that that are symbiotic that are working with you that are working in concert with what's happening yeah I, I, that was a great question a great thing to bring up and it reminded me of uh, the Terence McKenna book True Hallucinations where it describes him and Dennis going to um, somewhere in South America, La Charrera was where they were in particular when it happened, but he was talking about the insects and the sounds that they made and the medicine that they were taking was obviously from the the immediate area that they were in. So he was talking about that was the this, this sort of the sound of this psychedelic plant being metabolized uh, in a in a um god i don't even know how to describe it in a sort of a very holistic way like everything around them was helping them to metabolize this substance and i was going to bring that up too but sometimes the train moves too fast but all of the things that go into the ayahuasca brew come from that area so Mm. it's sort of probably the same thing there's nothing i mean it's all interconnected especially when you're talking about working within a such a tight vicinity you know it's all working in concert together it's uh, fascinating to me that uh, you know i'm just i love the natural world so much and i was just as you were talking the one thought that popped in my head was at a, a seminar that we were that i was at that 
Carlos was saying that if you can catch a lizard, if you're able, because lizards move very quickly in the desert, and if you can catch one and you can whisper to it that your whatever your intent is that that lizard will take your intent and and basically be like an emissary for you and so i was just thinking wow this is so incredible to think that one of the layers that we exist on is the physical plane but we are not the only thing that's um operating on that physical plane that you can really tap into squirrels and bugs and birds and trees and all of the things that are are of the natural world and you can communicate with with these other energies and it's our I think on some level one of the things that that Hamilton was saying is it's really our duty we are, we are the guardians of this earth uh, or should be to some degree and it's really our duty to uh, raise our frequencies to be able to tune in to these energies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're not used to operating that way. Uh, people in Western cultures aren't necessarily that tuned in, and they have no, really no reason to be tuned in to their greater environment. We're used to living in a electronically steeped um ecosystem where i mean the the light pollution blocks out the stars uh you can have lights to turn on during the night so it doesn't have to stop when the sun goes down i mean we're very out of the natural rhythms of of existence of natural existence so i think when i did ayahuasca it was in a basement but i mean it was a fixed up basement and you had ready access to the outdoors. But I think ideally, yeah, to be in the environment that the, not only the plant came from, but that we are a part of uh, is very important to tuning in to that uh, greater context that we're all um, entangled within and realize that we have a very important part to play in that and that we're inter- as interconnected as all, all of it is to it. Well, I think children naturally have that connection. Mm -hmm. And I think we tamp that or stomp that out of children. But I think the, 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 the nature of being an infant, part of the thing that he was talking about is the semantic of learning language and learning gender and learning role, uh, you know, and, and familial dynamics those are things that have to be to some degree um, taught by rote, like Mm -hmm. over and over and over again. But I think when, if you observe a a baby, if you observe a toddler that hasn't grown up around technology or isn't growing up around uh, those types of forces, there is just this natural communication that they have with the natural world with plant life with animals that is very pure. And I think it's important for us to remember that, that that none of this is a foregone conclusion. We don't, we don't have to go down the road of technocracy and, you know, going into the cloud or transhumanism or posthumanism. These are decisions that are being made moment by moment and how we interact with our environment is really informative with whether or not we are going to sign off on that story. And I just choose not to paint the world in this, this way where, you know, humans are gone or we are all in the cloud or we're all, we've all uploaded our consciousness. I, I don't buy that. I think that's something that, that people who are fearful of the natural world and fearful of death and uh, maybe have a very atheistic version of reality feel that that's what is necessary to carry on their lineage. And why hold on to being a human? I mean, I'm, almost positive if Chris Bache has anything to say about it, that we've incarnated as all kinds of things, all kinds of places. So 
humans probably won't exist someday as they didn't exist up until a certain point. Um, so I, I think it's important not to hold on to those things too. And I had another point that I was going to make and I totally freaking lost it. Gosh, darn it. It's, it's in there. It's in, it's in your, in your noodle. But it's not coming out of my mouth into the mic right now. It's which, what I need it to do. It'll be there in a minute. <laughs> it'll be there in a minute. <laughs> when you need it, it'll come back. I you'll need it now. It. You'll get it. It'll come back to you. You just gotta leave. You gotta make. Well, you gotta open the door. Give me some keywords. What were you? What sum up what you were saying? I was talking about our connection with the natural world and oh. how it's an it's an innate thing oh, that children not have. A, not a foregone conclusion. Yeah, that's the part I was thinking of. Yeah, is what wolf you want to feed? Um, none of this is a foregone conclusion. Most of Western, uh, the Western quote unquote reality consensus reality is to downplay your importance, downplay your place in the greater scheme of things. Yeah. Constantly. I mean, it's hard to really feel the weight of how how intense that is, but you are constantly being told. Uh, I mean, the origin story that they're trying to make up for you is sets the stage for the whole thing. It, it's just random fucking things happened, and it's lucky we even exist. Yeah. Uh, and it just makes you feel like, well, we can just randomly be blotted out too at the same time. And what am I going to do between those times? And blah, 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 blah. Yeah. What? Well, and that's why, that's one of the reasons that I brought the karmic agreement up to Hamilton is that I don't think that it was an accident that he showed up at the moment he showed up in the Amazon, that he was went on the journey and it could have been a generational agreement that was made long before Hamilton was Hamilton. You know, this, this could be some thing that came from, you know, 10 generations ago that a, that his, his DNA needed to, or, or had some, some arrangement that was made with the DNA in the Amazon and it just took 10 generations for it to manifest. Um, But I think that's the great mystery. I think that's what's so fascinating about being alive. And I fucking love being a human. I don't want to be a robot. I don't want to, you know, I would love to be a tree too, (laughs) but I, and I also feel very connected to the animal world. So I think the reason that I, it's not that I cling to humanness, but I I think I, I cling to the earth and this, this, um, version of reality that we're in, because I think that we live in an extremely magical time and when you go on to devices, if you go into the social media realm, you know, you see these, this bifurcated version of reality where what, you know, one version is that it, it is a foregone conclusion and the world is ending and we're fucked. And then there's this other reality that's saying the predators are losing and, and people are waking up. Well, I think those two things can exist at the same time. And it's really where like the, the prison or the, the freedom that you uh, have is based on what, where you allow yourself to be in your own mind. What she said. Right. (laughs) (laughs) No, I totally agree. Um, Perhaps we should wind it up since we're going on 15 minutes. Let's do it. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you got something very, very positive out of this. Um, Hamilton's a great dude, and I really do hope, let's just say I can't wait to go there and uh, do ceremony with you and meet him. It's so going to happen, and it, we don't have to wait five years. It's, you know, once you say those words out loud and there's more than one person that's standing in agreement with that, those things just seem to evolve and and they happen in a very organic, beautiful way. We just need our passports. I said within five years. Yeah. Yeah, that could be next week. Yeah, That could be exactly. four years and nine months down the road. Yeah. 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 <laughs>
I think we're a couple of chapters away from that. Oh, I was going to say Maybe. this existence, you liking Earth, like being a human. Yeah, I, I think that I used to get really upset by that and being attached to that and attached to my life and attached to all the people in my life. But then I started to look like at life like it's a book. Uh, and through life you put bookmarks in particular parts of the book that you liked, that were changing you, people that you love, so on and so forth. And then once your body dies, the bookmarks get ripped out. You still have the book, but the bookmarks get ripped out, and you just have to start a new book. Uh, that's why you build a big library up, and you can just hop from one book to another. And Anyway, that's that. That's a bummer. I I don't want to rip the bookmarks out. I feel like <laughs> the bookmarks. I like where the bookmarks are, but and they're the, fine. But the book stays. The bookmarks just go. That's, let's let's talk some, about this later. <laughs> <laughs> take some solace in that. <laughs> Any old way. Hope you enjoyed it. We <laughs> certainly did. We will be talking to him in the future for sure. Um, We're going to do a live streaming from Blue Morpho. <laughs> Mid ceremony. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you would like to contact us and give us critiques, give us praise, suggest guests, whatever. Recipes. Yes, casserole recipes. We're of always course. looking for recipes. Recipes, please. Uh, you can email us at the melt podcast at protonmail.com or hunter hyphen muse at protonmail.com. And as you probably know right now, or by now, I should say, because this is going to come out a few weeks down the line, but we have a different website address. We had domain issues, and um, that has been cleared up, but we're now at the meltpodcast.net instead of .com, but you probably have long figured that out by now. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. We love you. And uh, as always, we've got some fantastic, fascinating guests coming up, and we hope you enjoy them, too. You got it. Catch you on the flip side. Yes. Meow. (laughs) Ta-ta. To hear the full-length version of this episode, get access to exclusive and early episodes, and participate in our monthly Zoom meetups for as little as $3 per month, just click the Patreon link in the episode notes or visit patreon.com slash the melt podcast. Contributing financially will help to make this podcast my full-time gig that I can devote more time to and allow me to create more content. Other ways of contributing would be giving us a favorable review or rating wherever you get your podcasts, subscribing to us on YouTube, spreading the word wherever you and your tribe congregate, or just by sending us your positive thoughts and intentions. In a quantumly intertwined and holographic multiverse, these also go a long way. Thank you.